Today we're going to see how Zishan Ali, better known by his stage name of Smile to Jannah, renounces all fairness, decency and honesty and instead resorts to blatant falsehood and mockery to attack Ahmadiyya Islam. Here's all the falsehoods Smile to Jannah makes about Islam Ahmadiyya refuted. Let me tell you, he won't be smiling when he gets to the end of this video. Falsehood number one. His first error is to assert that Ahmadi Muslims reject that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Khatam al Nabiyin, or seal of the Prophets. This is a total falsehood. Hazrat Ahmad, peace be upon him, wrote about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the following terms Bear in mind that the charge leveled against me and my Jamaat, community, that we do not believe the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be the Khatam al Nabiyin, is a great calumny. The strength, certainty and understanding and solid conviction with which we believe the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, to be the Khatam and Nabiyin is millions of times stronger than the belief of others. They lack the capacity and they have no notion as to the true meaning and significance of Khatam and Nabuat. They have only inherited a word from their ancestors, but they do not comprehend the meaning or the significance of the belief in Khatam and Nabuat. Falsehood number two. His second error is to assert that the term Khatam al Nabiyin means final in time. Let's see what the great scholars and saints of Islam said on this very topic. Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, stated Say, he is the seal of the prophets, but do not say that there is no prophet after him. Abu Abdur Rahman Salami stated I was teaching Hassan and Hussein the recitation of the Holy Quran. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, passed by as I was teaching them. He said to me, Teach them to read Khatam al Nabiyin with a fatah on the letter Ta. Tirmidhi rahimahullah, stated that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. In our view, prophethood in its entirety came to an end with Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Then he, Allah, made his heart due to the perfection of prophethood a vessel which he then sealed. So he who is blind to this information holds that the interpretation of Khatam al Nabiyin is that he is the last of them, the prophets, to be raised. What kind of merit is this? What knowledge is in this? This is the interpretation of the foolish and the ignorant. Imam Mullah Ali Qari rahimahullah, states, Had Ibrahim radiallahu anhu lived and become a prophet, and likewise had Umar radiallahu anhu become a prophet, they would be followers of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, like Isa alayhi salam and Al-Khidr alayhi salam. This does not contradict the word of Allah wa khatam al nabiyin for it means no prophet can come after him who abrogates his religion and is not from his followers, Ummah. Hazrat Mawlana Muhammad Qasim Nanotvi, founder of the Deoband the sect, stated, The meaning of khatam, according to the layman, is that the Holy Prophet wasallam is the khatam in the sense that his era follows the era of the former prophets, and the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, appeared after all of the prophets. It will dawn on the learned that to be at the beginning or the end does not carry any significance. Therefore, appreciation of the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, cannot be expressed by interpreting the following verse in terms of time only. But he is the Messenger of Allah and the Seal of the Prophets. On the other hand, if the title is not considered to be a title of honor and appreciation, then the end of prophethood can be taken as correct. However, I am certain that this position will not be acceptable to any of the followers of Islam. He goes on to state on page 34 of the same book, If, for argument's sake, a prophet is born after the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, this does not have any effect on the Khatamiyat, seal of the Holy Prophet, peace be on him. Hazrat Mawlana Abul Hassan at Abdul Hayy Brelvi states, After the demise of the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, or even during his own lifetime, it is not an impossibility for someone to be a prophet, but a prophet with a new law is impossible. Hazrat Shah Waliullah Muhaddith of Delhi rahimahullah, stated, And the prophets came to an end with him. This means that no one can come after him whom Allah would commission to convey a new divine law to people. Hazrat Muhyiddin ibn Arabi rahimahullah, states, Thus we are certain that there are people within this ummah whose status has reached the status of prophethood held by the prophets in the eyes of Allah, but not the status of bearing a divine law. Does Zishan Ali believe all these revered persons were also non-Muslim? Falsehood number three. His third error is to think that revelation has finished. The Quran clearly states that angels descend upon true believers and speak to them in this very life at times of trial and difficulty. The Quran also states that messengers will always appear among the children of Adam. 
So who is Zishan to shut the mouth of God? In fact, the Quran states that those who obey Allah and his messenger Muhammad peace be upon him can become prophets within the Ummah. And whoso obeys Allah and this messenger of his shall be among those on whom Allah has bestowed his blessings, namely the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs and the righteous. And excellent companions are these. Zishan may say that this only means that those who obey Allah and his messenger will be with the prophets, but not one of them. But if you take that interpretation, then it applies not only to the prophets, but to the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, the Salihin. Does that mean that Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was not Siddiq, but will only be raised with the Siddiq? Does it mean that Hazrat Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, was not Shaheed, but he will only be raised with the Shuhada? How can that be true? You see, Allah has structured the sentence so that the word Ma'a applies not only to the prophets, but to all the categories of those whom Allah has blessed. Meaning that if it is understood as with, but not among or one of, then it means Islam is a dead religion that cannot even produce righteous individuals. Such a translation renders other verses of the Quran absurd too. For example, the Quran teaches us the following prayer. Our Lord, we have heard a crier calling us unto faith. Believe ye in your Lord, and we have believed. Our Lord, forgive us therefore our errors, and remove from us our evils, and وَتَوَفَّنَ مَعَ abrar Cause us to die with Ma'a, the righteous. If Ma'a means with but not one of, then this verse is telling us to pray that we should die at the same time a righteous person is dying. Not that we should be righteous ourselves when we die. Can such a foolish interpretation be possible? Further, Sahih Muslim clearly states that Allah will reveal words to the Messiah when he comes. Further, how will the Imam Mahdi be commissioned by God unless God tells him? How will he be guided by God if without revelation? Will he just think it up himself? If so, why should anyone believe his claim? If prophets can still come within the Ummah, as shown by the Quranic ayah above, and by the revered scholars quoted, then they must continue to receive revelation. After all, that is what distinguishes a prophet from others. This does not mean that they bring a new law, since not all revelation is law-bearing. Rather, their purpose will only to be to bring Muslims back to the teachings of Islam. Hazrat Ahmad claimed to be an Ummati prophet in exactly the way that the quoted saints of Islam stated prophethood continues. That is, a prophet who is fully within the bounds of the Islamic Sharia. He claimed to be a prophet by virtue of being a perfect follower of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His purpose was not to bring a new teaching, but to reform the Muslims and spread the message of Islam to all non-Muslims through peaceful means. If you're interested in the actual views of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community on the term seal of the prophets, read this. Falsehood number four. Zishan here openly lies and claims that Hazrat Ahmad, peace be on him, claimed to be the seal of the prophets. This is an out-and-out -out lie and fabrication. It is telling that he provides no evidence for this. In fact, the promised Messiah explicitly stated, It is undoubtedly true that not even a prophet can truly equal the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his holy excellences. Even the angels cannot dream of attaining those heights, let alone that anyone else should achieve an excellence comparable to him. What he explained, however, is that by virtue of being a perfect follower of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had become his reflection. Since I am the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, by way of Buruz, and all his perfections and excellences, including his prophethood, are reflected in the mirror of my perfect devotion, where then is the person who claimed to be an independent prophet? If you still do not accept me, then you should know that it is written in your own books of Hadith that the promised Mahdi will be like the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, both in character and appearance. His name will correspond to the name of the Holy Prophet, peace be on him, which means that he will be given the name Muhammad and Ahmad, and that he will belong to the Holy Prophet's household, peace be on him. It is written in some traditions that he shall be from me. This is a very subtle hint that he will derive his spiritual excellence from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, and will be a reflection of his spirit. This notion is strongly supported by the words which the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, used in describing his relationship with the promised Mahdi, as he went so far as to give him his own name. Hazrat Ahmad, peace be on him, makes a perfect argument here. In the Hadith books, it states that the Mahdi, when he comes, will be Muhammad and Ahmad. It states his father's name will be Abdullah and that he will be buried Fi Kabri, 
in the grave of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself. Now, will any Muslim dare to open the grave of the Prophet Muhammad? God forbid? Of course not. It is thus a metaphor, signifying that the Imam Mahdi is like the reflection of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, and his deputy for a later age. This is precisely what Hazrat Ahmad, peace be on him, claimed on the basis of divine revelation. Now, if Zishan objects to Hazrat Ahmad, peace be on him, describing himself as the perfect reflection of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, then he will have to object to the Prophet Muhammad himself describing the future Imam Mahdi in these terms. Will he dare to contradict the Messenger of Allah? Falsehood number five. Zishan claims that Hazrat Ahmad, peace be on him, claimed his signs to be greater than those of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Well, let's take a look at what he says. And then comparing himself to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, may peace, mercy and blessings of Allah be upon him. He goes on to say, the moon went into eclipse for him. And for me, both the sun and moon went into eclipse. This is false. The original poem is about the greatness of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hazrat Ahmad here in praise of the Prophet recalls the blessed prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, that the moon and sun would be eclipsed in the month of Ramadan for the Imam Mahdi. He therefore uses that sign as a means of praising the Prophet of Islam. In fact, in his book Hakikat al-Wahi, The Reality of Revelation, Hazrat Ahmad, peace be upon him, has stated that every sign of his truth is actually a sign first of the truth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, since it is only through his grace and beneficence that Hazrat Ahmad was granted his spiritual rank. Falsehood number six. With this error, Zishan claims that Hazrat Ahmad, peace be upon him, claimed in a vision that he saw himself as God. What he fails to tell you is what Hazrat Ahmad wrote along with that vision. Referring to the vision, he wrote, quote, this does not mean pantheism or incarnation of God, but was an illustration of the hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, which describes how through voluntary prayer, the virtuous draw near to God. In raising an objection against this vision, Zishan Ali has raised an allegation against the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and God himself. For the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in one of the most famous of the hadith Qudsi, tells us, Allah, mighty and sublime be he, said, Whosoever shows enmity to someone devoted to me, I shall be at war with him. My servant draws not near to me with anything more loved by me than the religious duties I have enjoined upon him. And my servant continues to draw near to me with supererogatory works, so that I shall love him. When I love him, I am his hearing with which he hears, his seeing with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks. Indeed, the Qur'an in fact describes the hand of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be the hand of God himself. Allah says, Verily, those who swear allegiance to thee indeed swear allegiance to Allah. The hand of Allah is over their hands. So whoever breaks his oath, breaks it to his own loss. And whoever fulfills the covenant he has made with Allah, he will surely give him a great reward. Was the hand of Allah literally over their hands? No, it was the hand of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But Allah states in the Quran that it was his own hand. Will Zishan Ali then throw out the Quran? Falsehood number seven. In this falsehood, Zishan in principle makes the same error as in the previous one. He makes an allegation that in fact becomes an allegation against God himself. He refers to the vision of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, in which he saw himself as Mary, the mother of Jesus, pregnant with Jesus. He then felt as if he was in the pangs of labor and about to give birth to Jesus. Zishan is ignorant, it seems, that Allah states that all believers are like one of two women, the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya, or like Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the time of conceiving him. It states, And the example of Mary, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private parts, so we breathed into him of our spirit, and she fulfilled in her person the words of her Lord and his books, and was one of the obedient. God here likens the highest level of believers to a pregnant Mary, referring to Mary as he. Would Zishan object to these words of God? Is his misogyny so internalized that he feels demeaned by being likened to a pregnant woman? Perhaps we should respond to him as Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad, may Allah have mercy on him. The fourth head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community responded to this allegation. That is, if you take this vision literally, then take the Quran literally. In which case, to be a Muslim, you only have one of two options. Either you are like Mary, the mother of Jesus, or you are like Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. If you think it a disgrace to be a pregnant woman, then to be a believer, you are only left with the option of being the sexual companion of Pharaoh, with all the disgrace that entails. 
Which will you choose, Zishan? In fact, this allegation is only evidence of the filthy minds of those who raise it. Again, if Zishan had bothered to read the original text of the Revelation, he would understand that this vision referred to Hazrat Ahmad's spiritual rank prior to being given the spiritual title of Masih for this Ummah. These are spiritual matters beyond Zishan's understanding, it seems. Falsehoods 8 and 9. These errors are so childish and pathetic that it is actually difficult to answer them. Here Zishan asserts that Hazrat Ahmad states that he became so ill that he quote lost his manhood. What Hazrat Ahmad actually stated was that his dissociation from the world including prolonged periods of fasting meant that he had lost all energy or inclination for fathering children. He then states how Allah granted him such strength thereafter that he fathered four sons. Zishan also asserts that Hazrat Ahmad described himself as the worm of the earth and in the Urdu Bashar ki in nafrat or a target of hate for mankind. Zishan translates the Urdu into a crude and vulgar manner to refer to genitalia so as to mislead his viewers. Only someone with his mind in the gutter would do so. Further, as highlighted by Brother Razi in his comprehensive response to Zishan, he does not realize that Hazrat Ahmad here was actually translating the words of the Prophet David from his Psalms when he described himself in the same way. The allegation therefore is actually an allegation against Hazrat Dawood as well. Falsehoods 10, 11, and 12. In these falsehoods, Zishan opens a can of worms and gets himself into all kinds of trouble, as he starts venturing from territory he knows little about to territory he knows nothing about. He begins by claiming that a man named Abdul Hakim, who was once a follower of Hazrat Ahmad, peace be upon him, left his following and correctly predicted the date of his death. This is false. Abdul Hakim left the following Hazrat Ahmad, peace be upon him, because he believed that one did not need to accept the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Hazrat Ahmad stated that it was absolutely mandatory to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, since belief in God can only be established by following him. Enraged, Abdul Hakim started predicting the death of Hazrat Ahmad. First, he said he would die within three years. Then he changed it and said God had specified that he would die within 14 months from July 1st, 1907, specifically from lung disease. He then changed it a third time, stating that he would die before August 4th, 1908. And then he changed it a fourth time, stating that Hazrat Ahmad would die on August 4th, 1908. He was ultimately proven wrong with the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, dying in May 1908. As for Abdul Hakim, he fell prey to his own prophecy, ultimately dying of lung disease himself. As for Molvi Sunao, Law of Amritsar, we see a similar picture emerge. That Zishan even dares to quote this example shows how little he knows about this terrified Molvi. Hazrat Ahmad, peace be on him, challenged to Mubahila 58 scholars of India, among them Sunaullah. He did not want to meet the challenge, but Sunaullah was pressurized to do so. Under this pressure, he first accepted the challenge of Mubahila in his book Ijaz Ahmadi on page 14. When the promised Messiah acknowledged his acceptance, Sanaullah quickly backed out, stating that he, quote, dare not accept such a challenge in his book Ilhamat e Mirza, edition 2, page 85. Then he made a further challenge, stating in Ahle Hadith paper of the 29th of March 1907 that he is ready for a Mabahila. When this second challenge was accepted, he again backed out, stating, I have only agreed to take an oath not to engage in a Mabahila, in his statement in the same paper on the 19th of April 1907. Finally, the Promised Messiah invited Sanaullah to make whatever statement he pleased and that he would agree to it. In response, Sanaullah made a statement in Muraqqa Qadiani, April 1907, page 9, that the liars are the ones who are granted long life, just as Musaylam outlived the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He also explicitly asked for a sign by which he would be granted long life from which he could take a lesson. In consequence, Allah applied to him the criteria that he asked for. The liar, Sunaullah, lived long, but the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, who is decades older than him, died shortly thereafter. And what of the lesson that Sunaullah asked by which he would be reformed? Brother Razi, aka Ahmadi answers, has raised an excellent point in this regard. That is, that Sunaullah did not live a happy life towards the end of his days. Towards the end of his life, during the riots of 1947, his own son was killed before his eyes, and his entire home looted of all his life's work. All the books he wrote in refutation against the promised Messiah were lost to him and burned. From the shock of that loss, he died of stroke a few months later, in March 1948. His final falsehood on the prophecies of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, is to assert that the promised Messiah prophesied that he would marry a girl called Muhammad Bayram, and that he didn't. We've already made a video here on this, 
but we'll give a summary nonetheless. The prophecy wasn't to marry some girl. The prophecy was in respect of his extended relative Mirza Ahmed Beg and his family, who had taken to atheism and abusing the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He told them under divine guidance that they should reform, and that if they did not, calamity would befall their house. They refused and continued obstinately. Within a short period of time, Mirza Ahmed Beg's niece died. Shortly thereafter, Ahmed Beg's own brother died too. Witnessing these quick calamities, three in the younger generation accepted the promised Messiah. When Mirza Ahmed Beg was forced to turn to the promised Messiah for monetary help, he replied, under divine guidance, that he should marry his daughter to him, so that through closer family ties, the promised Messiah's light and influence would spread among them. He said that if they didn't, he himself would die, and the husband he chose for his daughter would also die, within three years. Ahmed Beg refused his directive, and instead married his daughter Muhammadi Begum to another man. Within a year, Ahmed Beg was dead, and the house was plunged into grief. The family turned in repentance, entering into the following of the promised Messiah en masse, with Muhammad the Begum's own mother, her brother, her own son, her aunt, her cousins, her nephews, all accepting the promised Messiah and giving up their abuse of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Is this what Zishan Ali calls a failed prophecy? Since the purpose of the marriage was to enact reformation, once reformation was brought about, the purpose of marriage to Muhammad the Begum was served and was no longer necessary. Falsehood 13 to 17. Towards the end of his video, Zishan makes some truly absurd points. He invents his own self concocted criteria by which to judge a prophet's truth. Firstly, he states that prophets always have single barreled names, whereas Ghulam Ahmed is a double barreled name. Firstly, he misses the point that Ghulam Ahmed means the slave of Ahmed, Ahmed being the name of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, signifying the spiritual rank and office of the promised Messiah. Secondly, the entire premise of his argument is false. The Quran mentions itself many prophets who have double barreled names. In this excellent article from Al Hakam, for example, Jesus' name is referenced from the Quran as the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. The Quran also gives the names Dhul Noon and Dhul Kifl. The name Ismail, as pointed out by others, is also a double barreled name, meaning, Hear me, God. Secondly, he states that prophets didn't write. We believe, as Muslims, that only the Qur'an is the literal dictated word of God. To ensure this, Allah kept the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him illiterate, so that it could never be said that his words were mixed in with the words of God. That is why every surah except one begins with the words in the name of Allah. This is the unique feature of the Qur'an prophesied in the Bible itself. Yet Zishan wants to take this unique quality of the Qur'an away by asserting that all previous revelations were also pure dictation, when in reality, they were revelation from God written in the words of the Prophet. After all, when Moses went up the mountain to receive the Torah, who does he think wrote it? Did God write it? When the Prophet David wrote the Psalms known in the Quran as Zabur, who does he think wrote it? If he thinks these books contain pure revelation, then he contradicts the Quran itself, which claims to be uniquely the only pure revelation from God to man. Thus, it stands proven that past prophets did write, indeed, the religious texts by themselves, under inspiration from God. Thirdly, he claims that prophets didn't have teachers, and because the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, had a teacher of Arabic when he was a young boy and a teenager, he cannot be a prophet. Where does he get this criteria from? Certainly, the prophet is not taught what is necessary for his prophetic function by any human. But does that mean the prophets do not learn worldly matters from others? Does not every prophet learn a language from his mother and father? Did not the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, learn the art of buying, trading, selling as a young man from someone? Did he not learn the route to Syria on his trading journeys from someone when he took Hazrat Khadija's caravan, may Allah be pleased with her? Does not the Quran explicitly tell the Prophet, peace be upon him, to consult others in important matters? If he had nothing to learn from others, what on earth was the point of consulting them? Did the Prophet of Islam know already the battle tactic of digging a trench around a city? Or did he learn this from Salman Farisi? Zishan shows his ignorance of Islam by advancing arguments that become allegations against the Prophet Muhammad himself. Fourthly, Zishan claims that the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, failed a clerical exam as a teenager, and that therefore he cannot be a true prophet. On the one hand, he claims that a prophet cannot learn from him and anyone else, and on the other, he expects prophets to pass exams. The reason he failed is for the reason he himself gave. 
because he was too busy compiling allegations Christians had leveled against Islam. As a young man, he writes, he had compiled 3,000 allegations of Christians against Islam. Is this supposed to be a mark of shame against him? His final allegation is that angels sent to the promised Messiah have strange names. In one dream, he cites, the promised Messiah writes that he met a man who seemed to be an angel of God, who informed him that his name was Tichi, as he placed money in his lap. This is a strange name for an angel, according to Zishan. How can an angel be named Tichi? He fails to tell you what the promised Messiah explained after narrating the dream itself. He stated, Tichi in Punjabi language is the name for an appointed time, i.e. I come exactly at the needed time. He goes on to explain that this dream was an explanation that God would always provide him money at the needed time, and that this had been fulfilled thousands of times for him, that money is sent to him at the very moment of need. Thus, Tichi is an attributive and explanatory term. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, explains in his book Elucidation of Objectives that all revelation of all forms always occurs through Hazrat Jibreel. Only the degree to which an individual is able to receive the fullness of Jibreel's manifestation is dependent on the spiritual capacity of the recipient, the fullest manifestation being received by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What Zishan demonstrates is a total lack of insight, research or honesty. He has, like so many YouTubers before him, not actually read the sources he quotes. He only goes to anti-Ahmadiyya websites and regurgitates quotations. And that's exactly what Christian clerics do against the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and anti-theists do with the Qur'an. In that regard, Zishan, sadly, is no better. As stated by one astute Ahmadi, Muslim YouTuber culture has created an entire generation of Muslim youth who focus primarily on refuting others before even learning basic Islamic manners and etiquette. How right he is. Unfortunately, Zishan Ali, also known as Smalta Jannah, is guilty of precisely that.